Welcome back. Now we will move to the panel Fight and Warrior in Literature. Uh, we'll start with uh, Martelina, Martelina Gabrych, a student from University of Wrocław. Uh, she, will she will be presenting a speech on uh, modern across cultures, the different approaches to the heroine in the Asian Chinese ballad and the Disney's adaptation. Do you need anything, Martelina? Uh, no, I will share the screen. Just give me a moment. Okay. Um... Uh, can you see it or can you see the presentation or can you see yourself? Uh, I see presentation. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, uh, hello everybody. Uh, as it was already said, my name is Martina Gabe. I am a student of Synology at the University of Wrocław and it's my first time attending this kind of event, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am very excited to present you part of my bachelor degree paper uh, when I talk about differences in uh, Mulan across cultures uh, today because of the time limit. I will only talk about two works of art. First is the Ballad of Mulan, that was, uh, this is a UFO, which means a folks ballad. It was written during Northern Wei Dynasty, and that's the first time uh, Mulan appeared in any kind of art uh, that we know of. Uh, and uh, the second uh, work is the Disney's 1998 uh, cartoon uh, in the title of Mulan, which I would argue is the best well-known work to the Western audience. So the base of the story is more or less the same in these two works. Uh, there is a girl that takes her father, father's place in military and uh, later because of her bravery she is awarded by the emperor but she denies the honors and goes back home. Uh, but even though they are the same, the, the base of the story is the same, there are some differences to the approach of how Mulan is shown. In the Ballad of Mulan, she is uh, firstly a female, and she is a very conventional female, a typical one, you could say. When we meet her in the ballad, she is to, by the loom, and the action of weaving is actually um, very, uh, very, Femininely, uh, in Chinese culture, there is a Chinese saying, Nango Niuzhi, which means the men are, are tilling the soil and women are weaving. Uh, this, uh, this, this saying means gender roles, typical gender roles. So for Chinese, weaving is a typical female role. Uh, and uh, she's having something on her mind. Uh, she stops the action and the Rilika subject automatically assumes because she's a female that there is a love problem going on. But Mulan denies it and she says no one is on daughter's heart, no one is on daughter's mind. Uh, that sent, even though she denies this, Alan in his study of dressing and cross-dressing of Chinese female warrior uh, says that there is intertextuality. Uh, he found uh, a other set of UFO folks ballad called Jiang Liu Zhigo, the Willow Branch Song, uh, which talks about uh, blighted love and delayed marriage. Uh, this base, this inter intertextuality shows a possibility that there is actually someone's on one's heart, but right now the problem of her father's conscription overshadows the other problem and even if it's not true even if she really doesn't have anyone on her mind uh, it still sets certain assumption for the reader we think we think that uh, her story would probably go uh, in this typical way where she's an abundant wife or abundant lover her lover goes to work and she stays at home 
but not in this story. In this story, this is the Mulan that decides to go in her father's place. And what one would think that when she dressed as a male, there would be a detailed description of that. But no, it's not uh, in here. Actually, the only scene of cross-dressing is seen through the outfitting of the horse. Uh, she, we don't know if Mulan is wearing any armor uh, or what weapon did she wield. We don't know anything of that. Uh, what we know though is that she bought a horse, a saddle, bridle, and a long whip. So everything is connected to the horse. Uh, this very important scene is not shown through Mulan, but through a horse, which is a symbol of masculinity. And when she finally leaves, uh, she first say goodbye to her parents. This is very important because she, uh, her main value that is uh, described by the poem is filial piety, uh, or in Chinese, xiao. This is a very important Confucian value, and she is full of it. This is the most important part of the story, uh, not her bravery, but her filial piety. And she got blessing from her parents. She didn't go against their wishes to work. She, she, the, the, her parents agreed. Uh, when, she, when she's on her journey, we are constantly reminded that she's not in the place that she's supposed to be. And we also get this feeling of isolation from her, from her family because there's, that there's a sentence that re re is repeated twice she doesn't hear the sound of father and mother calling. And this is in contrast with a very hostile environment and the strange sounds like the water cry, the cry of the horses, the wind, and this not very pleasant words like chilly light. This shows that the environment she is right now is very hostile to her, unfamiliar, and she would rather be at home with her family. We see her, the pain, her pain not being with her parents. We don't have any combat scene in the ballad. We don't know how Mulan fought. Uh, if We know that she was a brave soldier because she was invited to an audience with the emperor. But apart from this, we can only guess uh, how the war looked like. And even this important scene of audience with the emperor is only a background for her file of piety. Uh, so the emperor uh, gives her chance of promotions, promotion, but she denies it. She said that she only wished for a camel so she can go back home. When she is back home, she's greeted by her parents, her older sister and younger brother, uh, because she's got a brother. Uh, and uh, then she uh, redress back to her female garments and when she does that that's the first time she says she there's a prono pronoun wa which means i used so that's the first time the mulan actually speaks with her own mouth before that uh, it's all description of the relica subject uh, and when she speaks and she finally speaks she doesn't convey any revolutionary message what she does she describes how she dressed back as a female. Uh, she leaves this strange garment of men's and go back to her typical dress. Uh, there, are, it's like in contrast with the scene of cross dressing. The scene of red dressing is very detailed. We have a lot of words. We know that she does her, does her hair, her makeup, where she does that, what she wears, and then when she's finished. She leaves and that's the time when she shows that she's a female to her comrades. Before that, we don't even know that she actually uh, was uh, disguised as a man. We didn't know that from the ballad up until these last few stanzas. They are amazed that they didn't know that she is a female. And there is a little hint of, hint of uh, female and male equality at the end using a metaphor of two hairs running alongside and no one can say if they are male or female. So to sum up, uh, this is a Chinese version of the ballad. The blue part is where she is at home. The black one is her journey. 
uh, at where she actually is at war, but we don't see any combat and we don't see any of her uh, bravery. And the green one is her audience with the emperor, but we also, that's only a background for her fellow piety deeds. So in short, this ballad is all about Mulan's fellow piety, doesn't really convey any re revolutionary message of uh, feminism, uh, even if it even if though it get a hint of this equality, but this is not about feminism, it's more about foul piety. Disney's Mulan is a little different. So from the length of the movie, we can we know that most of the movie, more than 50 minutes, she's actually outside of her home at war. And also there are so, some scenes of combats to be seen there. Uh, actually, what we see at the beginning of the movie is Mulan's individuality. She is not a typical female, but she's also not a typical human being. She thinks outside the box. The first uh, print screen of the movie is uh, where she uh, uses her dog to feed hands. She basically is very creative, thinks a little bit different of the basic things. But she's also not very comfort uh, in this female role she is uh, that was put on her by the society. She's not a typical female either. When she goes to matchmaker, she doesn't know how to behave. She's a little clumsy. She looks at other women that also go there and tries to mimic their behavior because she doesn't know how to be how to properly behave as a proper female. She's also, when she cross-dressed, when she became a man, she's also not a manly, she's not a manly woman. She, she's a little bit awkward of a man. People think, people think that she's weird. Uh, and she also says that men disgust her. So, disgust her. So, basically, she's not also a mainly female, but she's not also feminine female too. Uh, and she's still creative, and this creativity led her to achieve many goals that other people couldn't. For example, she was the only one to complete the task of climbing the pole and taking the arrow down by using the weights as the support. Also, at the uh, war with Hans, she thought of firing the cannon towards mountains and create snow slide, so the snow will burrow the enemy underneath. That's how she say, saves her brothers in arms. So, uh, moreover, what is also different in this Mulan than the Ballad, this Mulan is very rebellious. She's not a devoted, loyal daughter. Uh, she lives her own way. For example, when she cross-dressed, there's this very dramatic scene of cross-dressing, she cuts her hair. In ancient Chinese culture, it was seen her was seen as a gift from one's parents, and once no matter if uh, you were a male or female, you wouldn't cut your hair. But she does that; she denies the gift of, from her parents, and she also doesn't she doesn't get the blessing for living to war. She lives without saying anything after having a quarrel with her father when her father told told her told her to. No, learn to know her place. She just lives, and uh, her father. When the, her father learns about this, he ran out and falls into the mud. So, not very foul daughter. And uh, very important. So, uh, we already know that Mulan is a untypical person, and her, this story is not about her feudal piety. It's about her journey towards self-understanding and self-actualization. Uh, this is well. This is apparent uh, because of the mirrors and her reflection. There is a song right after the matchmaker scene when she sings about uh, not understanding herself, not knowing who she's supposed to be, and pretending to be this perfect female. Uh, for example, by the words, who is that girl I see staring, staring straight back at me? Why is my reflection someone I don't know? Also, there is this very dramatic scene when she uh, takes her makeup off and sings, when will I finally know who, am I, who I am inside? 
Uh, mirrors are seen through all of the journey of Mulan. For example, by when she cross-dressed, you, you can see her reflection in the swords. And uh, at the end, when she already put the hands under the snows and she was discovered to be female, expelled from the arm army, she looked at her helmet, see her reflection and says, uh, maybe I didn't go for my father. Maybe I went to prove that I could do what's right, so that when I look in the mirror, I'd see something worthwhile. That basically uh, sums up why she did went for this journey. She went there not for her father, but to find the real self, to prove that she is a worthy female. This new one is also a little more into feminism. Uh, so throughout all of the movie, uh, the inequality between male and females are constantly apparent. For example, uh, that there's a death penalty for uh, impersonating a man in the army. Uh, no one wants to listen to Mulan when she went to the, uh, uh, to the capital to save the emperor. She wanted to warn people, but no one wants to listen to her. And she said a sentence to her general. You said you trust Ping. Why is Mulan any different? Ping is her male alter ego. Uh, so, uh, so these inequalities are constantly there, and she goes against it. Against it, for example, by the sentence or uh, by um, singing. When she, when people sing what they want in woman, she said that maybe a girl that got the brain. So not only about her body. Uh, and uh, when she saves the emperor, she saves the emperor as a female, uh, and she was appreciated as a female. That's a pretty, uh, pretty strong message about equality because she was as strong or even stronger than any male soldier. But it also where her journey towards finding herself ends. She finally realized that she can be herself and do something good. But Disney's also like to destroy things, and the ending of the ballad, uh, the ending of the movie is basically what it is: a destroying message, be destroying this powerful message of uh, women being equal. Because at the end, Mulan goes back home, and General Li Shang uh, follows her. And when he does, there are these sexist remarks of her grandmother that first say before General Li enters. Uh, she said, the grandma says, uh, she could at least bring a man from the war. And when uh, she sees uh, General Lee, uh, proceed to say, oh, sign me up for the next war. So basically, that conveyed a message that girls are only good if they, they can be brave, but they need to find a husband at the end. But I would argue that without this sexist remark, that would be a great message because where Mulan find her love wasn't when she was forced to, wasn't there where she pretend to be someone else, but she fell in love in a man that accept her for who she really is. And that would be a very good message if there wasn't this remark of the grandmother. So ironically, the movie ends with more sexism than feminism compared to the ballad that didn't want to convey this kind of message. Thank you very much for listening to me. That's all from me. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, now we have some questions. Oh, sorry, that question, your speech. Uh, now we have some questions for you. Uh, what is your opinion? Uh, maybe the most important thing, the fem uh, thing female martial artists can learn from Mulan. Uh, I think it really depends if we uh, look at the literature, the piece of literature, or if we look at the movie. So in the piece of the literature, we we would see that um, you don't really need to prove yourself uh, to anyone that a female is uh, brave enough because that's not important. You just do you. You do you go fight there even if the society doesn't want you to. You go fight there and just be true to yourself. But when it comes to the cartoon, I would say the cartoon conveys more of this message that uh, you need to fight for your equal rights. 
and show show that you can be a capable warrior. Okay, thank you. And I have a question for you. Uh, did you watch the movie or only the cartoon? Uh, yes, I watched the movie and I will uh, I will write about this in my bachelor degree paper. So it was uh -huh. good part of it. I just didn't have time to talk about this here. Because... Uh, so maybe you can say something right now because we still have time. Okay, so the, the movie is uh, wanted to share, first it wanted to be more uh, in accordance with the Chinese culture. That's why the dragon mushu was uh, replaced by the phoenix and uh, the hawk became a witch for some reason. Uh, that's not very Chinese, but they tried to. But yeah, it also, it also is more into feminism. The movie is more into feminism than the cartoon. Uh, first, because we don't have this uh, sexist remark of the grandmother, the phoenix being a symbol of feminine of uh, woman, and also that um, this witch that was there uh, was for showing that um, she all she this witch always saying about the um, uh, how she was treated wrong. How she, uh, how she needed to be this monster to be, to be seen as, she needs to be seen as a monster because she is a fighting woman, a warrior, but all, all the people see her as a witch. But I will still say that this movie did a poor job in this feminism part because Mulan was born with superpowers basically. At the beginning, we know that she is full of, of strong chi, whatever it is, uh, because we know that chi is the energy that everyone got, and not only Mulan, this is a chi that not only warriors got, but in this movie, Mulan got chi for some reason. And uh, she, we see her doing incredible things that no, one, no other people could since a very small child. So basically, this movie also this movie threw out all of this training that Mulan got in the cartoon that made this that made a strong message that women also can be good. Okay, they are not as strong as men, uh, but they can fight in other ways. In this movie, you can be in the movie twenty twenty the twenty twenty movie. You can be a strong female, but uh, you need to be a strong female to be a good warrior. So you cannot be a warrior if you don't have superpowers. So I would say that this conveys a pretty mixed up message. So this wanted to be more into Chinese culture, but they still did a wrong job, bad job in, for example, mixing up the symbolism, uh, adding which, which looks more than a Western story than a Chinese story. Uh, also, uh, they did a poor job in this female male equality when they basically made a Mulan a superhero. So you can be a good woman, but you need to be a superhero. In other way, you are like the Mulan sister that is a typical woman that finds herself a husband. That's the only way you can go with it. Um, and yeah, so so I don't, I'm not really a fan of the movie, as you can hear, I think. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, another uh, question. Um, can you tell us something more about your bachelor studies and how Mulan fits in there? <laughs> okay, so uh, my bachelor thesis is actually all about Mulan. I am looking at uh, the changes through uh, the culture. So how the, the Chinese culture uh, change in uh, the, depicting Mulan? and then how our culture, the Western culture, took it and made a little bit different story. So I am still, I am, I am still very, really on the beginning, uh, but I've read actually a lot about this and uh, I will first look at the ballad, which I already wrote, that's a really finished chapter. Uh, later I will go into uh, how it changed throughout the years because the picture of Mulan was used, for example, in the Tang Dynasty. And to uh, there are pictures when Mulan has these bound feet. Who knows what bound? I I hope you know what bound feet are. Um, but this is very for me. It's very interesting that there is a picture of Mulan with bound feet because how could she pa fought fight with these small feet? The woman couldn't really walk with them, but she still goes there and fights. Uh, the, her surname, Hua, was written 
uh, before, uh, it wasn't there in the Bala, but was later added. So people uh, cho for the people started thinking that she's her surname is Hua. She was used as uh, in the Sino-Japanese War to kind of boost up morale that uh, there was a very brave warrior, so China can win with uh, Japan. Uh, the, she was also used in the communists by communists to show that female are can also uh, can be equal because the uh, communist party wanted to push through this equality where women also go and work. Uh, so Moa was also used to convey this idea. Mm, and modern modern in China right now there is a, a movie from two thousand eight Hua Mulan which is a answer to the cartoon and it's more into feminism uh, uh, but it still have this part of Chinese culture that the cartoon did wrong so that's basically an answer to the cartoon why uh, in the western world Mulan is usually uh, well it's usually used to say this to, to show this uh, equality to, show, to push through this feministic idea that wasn't really that much into Chinese culture earlier. And it's very, very about individualism because our culture is more about individualism. As you can see in the cartoon, this, this kind of depiction of Mulan persists in our culture. Uh, yeah, so uh, I will, in, in this part, uh, I will do, I will take, uh, I will write about uh, the uh, movie from 2020, uh, the cartoon, and I also will write about uh, the Kingston, uh, so like uh, the Kingston book, uh, the female warrior. Especially, I will like uh, take. I will put emphasis on the one chapter, which is the White Tiger. I think that's how it's, how it was called. And, didn't write that down and I am terrible with names, but I think it was the white tiger. Okay, so that's all, right? <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Matalina, for your speech. And now we'll have a small break and we'll start with the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you.
Now we will move to the panel Martial Arts in Pop Culture. Uh, we'll start with Master of Arts Przemysław Pavelec from the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow. With, present, uh, with presentation, uh, Wushu and other difficult words versus algorithms, Chinese martial arts on social media, based on the example of Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my theme of my uh, presentation, how, how you, you uh, say, uh, uh, Wushu and other difficult words, and uh, social media uh, with algorithms. Uh, when my analysis, uh, the algorithm in terms of the media as a regulator on information flow have a huge impact on the content shown on social media. Uh, they regulate, among other fragmentation of, of information about, about cultural phenomena, such as, uh, for example, China martial arts. Of course, uh, not only uh, China martial arts, not only uh, information about uh, culture, about cultural phenomena, uh, not only about uh, uh, clear um, mass media news, but uh, uh, Chinese martial arts are uh, on, uh, is an example of a uh, situation where uh, algorithm regula regulating uh, information flow. Um, algorithm, uh, Algorithms. We can uh, say about this about uh, in uh, three aspects: in social technological uh, relationships, uh, when uh, they uh, can shape social information, have a cultural impact, on and directly affect individual life, and uh, the part of the universe of uh, data flow between machines. Uh, three examples are. Uh, uh, are uh, connected with other elements of uh, transmission of information uh, from uh, to, to receiver and uh, from social media to receiver, of course. And uh, we can uh, see as uh, the social technological relationships are uh, where the the use the users uh, connect uh, with uh, social media every day, every every time. And uh, when uh, we start a uh, uh, connection with media, when we uh, start uh, Facebook, when we start uh, mm, uh, when we start Instagram and, and other social media, of course, and now we can uh, shape social formation because uh, cultural impact as uh, the the one of the most elements of uh, communication uh, between. Uh, social mass media and uh, his users. And of course, uh, the part of universe of data flow between machines. Of course, uh, when uh, mobile phones, with computers, when algorithms uh, connected with the other or other mass media as elements of information, information connection. Uh, social media. Uh, as uh, Madalena Kruszenba weekly says, uh, for the auto social media is a group of uh, applications based on the internet solution, of course, based on ideological and technological foundation of Web uh, 2.0, and a breed of creation and a change of content generated by the users themselves. Uh, of course, uh, the Web uh, 2.0 is not uh, the most actually uh, part of uh, technological foundation because uh, Web is uh, now we have a, a Web 3.0, Web 4.0. But uh, if, if, if now I, I say about uh, Chinese martial arts in um, algorithm, I am thinking about uh, Web 2.0 because it's the uh, most is the more connected with uh, with this thing. Uh, how uh, Chinese martial arts uh, uh, can um, lives can uh, watch in uh, can be watched in social media. Uh, Chinese martial arts and social media, of course, not e. Uh, on the paratechnical para level, is uh, three. Uh, uh, we have a uh, three elements: information dispersion, information roles, and the potential models, and activities of the main participation in the information flow process. Uh, information dispersion. Uh, how you say? How you know when you, when you use it, uh, uh, social media? The information uh, which you which you have, which uh, 
which you can uh, load uh, is a transmission uh, to to you and uh, but information uh, roads in, uh, in on other on an other sources and uh, creating in potential models of communication uh, in in mass media analysis is a um, very very uh, much uh, models of uh, roads in potential. Now I uh, now I uh, say only on the information uh, when information roads uh, to the to the receiver and activated the main participation in, in the information flow process. Uh, how I said uh, the most elements of uh, activity in uh, that, that process created. Uh, um, Created the reception of uh, Chinese marshals about about uh, algorithms when uh, the social media uh, created uh, um, a Chinese martial arts team about uh, in the um, in this how you how you can see hardware apps uh, algorithms in the general using target uh, data model and. Uh, when when we can when we uh, can fit in about uh, Chinese martial arts in, in Facebook, we can preparing uh, we can uh, thinking about preparing and publishing messages, comments, the role of transmitter, especially filtering algorithms, and individual or collective uh, content verification process. Uh, as you know, uh, you watch a, a new information about Chinese martial arts. You can uh, comment about uh, cultural aspect, about uh, schools, about uh, Chinese uh, martial arts styles, and, and many, many, many others. And uh, you can uh, verification uh, w w this, uh, this information individual as uh, as a single uh, analyzer or a collective in a, I don't know, maybe martial arts uh, fans book. And uh, one of the most role uh, have a, a, a transmitter because filtering uh, algorithms, uh, which uh, created uh, a teams of uh, that messages when uh, you uh, can watch. Them. And uh, you know, what uh, what it's concerned with? We filter in topics about China martial arts. Example, said the upsteps, problems, how uh, uh, said uh, earlier. Uh, verification of the content of China martial arts. Interviews with masters, reports, maybe from schools, maybe from travelers, uh, statistical data. Mm, as above, uh, but uh, with the use of comments, with, uh, when uh, the recipients uh, can um, talking about uh, his opinion, their opinion, and uh, preparing and publishing uh, new messages. Of course, new messages, it's uh, new, new, new discourses. So, uh, about Chinese martial arts, uh, Many, many, many people uh, can create messages with using of uh, Facebook, for example, and that's the same. Uh, the, the new discourses are uh, created. In conclusion: uh, the impact of social mod me social media on the image of Chinese martial arts, uh, though of course uh, potential to motivate. Uh, to influence media users, to define the experience of their consumers, and all other, of course. Mm, and short summary, uh, so that algorithms can be treated as uh, responsible for uh, linking social media with decisions uh, made by recipients in their world about training, training martial arts, uh, of course, and uh, but uh, it depends uh, what uh, what uh, receivers receivers uh, uh, looking in social media. 
maybe other about information about uh, culture, maybe uh, schools, maybe um, tradition. But uh, what uh, they need uh, created um, what they uh, what they uh, want to to watch in social mass media as a Facebook. Literature, sorry, but uh, only in Polish, one, one, and one in English. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your speech. You. And now we have a question for you. Yes. Uh, are there any dangers these algorithms can provide? Oh, dangers. Um, it's it's uh, it's not too easy to say because uh, it depends uh, if, if we have uh, uh, child children uh, such information or uh, or adult such information because uh, adult people uh, can uh, ver verification uh, the, this what what uh, algorithms how how algorithms uh, created information, but uh, very young people uh, can not um, can't uh, verification information and um, algorithms uh, can um, with with especially contact can be more uh, dangerous for for him, especially when uh, the information is. Uh, is not not uh, not uh, not re really. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now we have another question. Uh, yeah. Is there any negative impact on the image of martial arts provided via social media? Oh yes. Uh, very very negative, uh, especially uh, when uh, when we can uh, watch uh, only heroes, but not uh, only uh, the the real uh, the real uh, martial art masters. When the the heroes is most important. When uh, the the receivers uh, watching martial arts in movies and in social media, and they think uh, that uh, that the, the fight the the creation of uh, of uh, training process, um, the, their uh, brutality is the the, the most uh, important uh, part of, of the martial arts. I think that that is real, but uh, in uh, 1990 percent is it's not real. So so uh, I'm thinking uh, I think uh, mass media uh, sometimes um, not it, it is. Aren't not uh, good uh, sources of about uh, mass media, but uh, um, but transmission information uh, can be some watching uh, can, can be show uh, more interesting information. Okay, thank you. And the next question. <laughs> is what are the solutions for example facebook uh, can provide to diversify their, sorry diversify the ways to see the image <laughs> oh hmm. there's a date. no it's <laughs> it's uh, it's not 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 a question because uh, the Facebook has a uh, uh, individual policy and uh, about information, and uh, how I said uh, in when we use uh, a Facebook or, or other uh, social media, uh, we should uh, we should uh, thinking about selected uh, again and again and again, not uh, not. Uh, situation when when uh, the Facebook is the one and uh, one and the main uh, sources uh, about mass media. So I think it's 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 not not easy because uh, it it depends uh, how I said uh, how I said 
uh, what uh, receiver uh, searching mm. must be that. Maybe brutality, maybe only information about uh, Chinese martial arts, his tradition, or maybe uh, bloody fights. But uh, I think uh, selected and selected, individual selected is, is the most important part. Okay, thank you very much for your speech and for the answers. Uh, now we'll, we'll make a break a little bit uh, longer because 20 minutes, I guess, and we'll see you after this time. Thank you very much.
Now we'll start with Dr. Torfield from Ernest Center for Philosophy and the Arts presenting a speech, Being Raptured, Bruce Lee's Liberation as Even. Doctor, do you need anything? Uh, no, it looks fine. Can you hear well? Oh, uh, yes, I can. Okay, great. Sorry. And the slide is up? Yes, it is. Yeah, all right, yeah. great. Well, uh, first, thanks for a great conference and a very technically proficient uh, execution. This is a paper that uh, is developed from uh, on uh, 20 years back, was working on the on the PhD with Roehampton University in the UK. And uh, this was part of that research for a degree in, um, well, philosophy of sports. So we will return to that uh, during the paper, but uh, this is about a, a development of that topic. Um, Bruce Lee talks about liberation in his uh, texts, and we will uh, discuss this as an event in this paper. There is a trauma at the core of our experience. There is a trauma at the core of our experience of Bruce Lee. And we can go on and we can say there is a trauma at the core of Bruce Lee's experience of himself. We expect and take for granted that our being in the world is whole and sutured, stitched together. This is the reason that we often hear in sociology that what lies at the heart of social disorder is a fragmented sense of identity. When those who are vulnerable get a better sense of themselves as entire persons, as whole beings, we hear, society will also heal. The very word healing is connected to this notion when we are wounded or when we are in parts, we reach out for healing to become whole. We have gotten so used to this uh, that we regulate our social interaction also as academics according to such complete units. Disciplines and for Bruce Lee styles are separated into camps and for each of them there are discrete and exhaustive sets of apparatuses, practices of assessment and dissemination that should not and cannot be mixed. Can we, in this very novel discipline of martial arts studies, which we surmise is merely about 10 years old, expect a more complex approach to disciplinary work? We ask this because what we attempt to do in this paper is to flush over the edges or martial arts studies with psychoanalysis, philosophy, and aesthetics. In what we are calling the sociological reading of the phenomenon that is Bruce Lee, there is much that is true. The distribution of his uh, films and to a lesser extent his writing has created a popular figure of the self-conscious oriental, an impenetrable Iron Man, from the East with the might to crush his colonial master. His early demise in 1973 was shrouded in mystery and speculations, and these speculations had, about what caused his death had carried on, even though the evidence seems to be clear. We will not go into that here. So, uh, Lee, uh, is, as a figure of, it stands as a figure of, of danger and, and sort of this embodied human force that stands in contradiction to an increasingly technically advanced age where science and their machines do the fighting on our behalf, drones and what have you. This might be one of the reasons that we find martial arts in many contemporary science fiction films uh, type uh, The Matrix. Here Lee and his fighting techniques serve as a contrast to the fragmentation we experience in our hurried and demanding world. Lee is an icon for the embodied fighter, the underdog who against all odds has the capacity to succeed against this impending darkness. This is a promise in this view of a lost wholeness or, or a totality that can be retrieved. So what then with the rupture, the wound of Bruce Lee? The answer is that when we approach the image of Bruce Lee as a whole, as sutured totality, we are quickly confronted with its fractured nature. What we will try to show here is how these fractures come out in a psychoanalytic, philosophical and aesthetic approach to the figure that is Bruce Lee. In other words, what we try to accomplish is a supplementary reading 
to the sociologically oriented perception of Lee. For isn't the emergent story of martial arts precisely one of identity formation? We learned that prior to 1973, there wasn't really anything such as martial arts in the English language. It was Bruce Lee and the film Enter the Dragon that uh, gave this concept and its attendant imagery, imaginary figure and subject, the martial artist, to our culture. Further, we learn an absolutely crucial turning point occurred with the release of Wu-Tang Clan's album Enter the Wu-Tang in 1993, a direct reference to the Bruce Lee film when it became possible to articulate Bruce Lee's counter-colonial fighting with a deeper and more global sense of black consciousness. Again, the notion that martial arts and its mutations in popular culture could do some healing work for troubled youth features prominent. As we will go on to see, this idea of totality was central also to Bruce Lee's perception of his own practice. So we will now go on to talk about the totality of, for instance, Bruce Lee, yeah? Uh, so the totality of anyone, but it could also be Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was born in America, but he grew up with his parents in Hong Kong. His father's career as a stage performer must have rubbed off on him because by the time he was 18, he had appeared in around 20 films. Paul Bauman, the British um, scholar, has pointed out that most fan talk about Lee elevate him as a fighter and the type of masculinity that we have come to associate with him is one of invulnerability and prowess. However, what this image covers over is that Lee first was an artist and only then a martial artist. In other words, we stand more to gain from investigating his legacy with an emphasis on his art rather than strictly on the fighting. Yeah? This was an approach that promoted the art of fighting without fighting. What emerges out of this is a fighter who actually shied away from fighting to the greatest extent possible. Bauman is quick to point out that Bruce Lee was not the only recognized fighter to avoid combat. However, testimonies from those who did fight him indicate that Lee was most interested in the kind of fighting that looked good on the screen. Big kicks and flashy looking things that he just made up on the spot as Bauman puts it. In other words, Bruce Lee was an artist, an actor and performer with a keen eye to visual effects. First and foremost, what Lee gave us was an image of a fighter. Thus, with a psychoanalytic view and more precisely the perspective from Sigmund Freud as it was developed by his French disciple Jacques Lacan, subjects such as Lee, for instance, are entities who are restricted to seeing themselves through their own eyes. We see ourselves only through our own eyes. What that means is that the perspective of wholeness and unity, the body, as a complete and non-fragment entity, can only come from the outside, provided by someone else or by the image of ourselves in the mirror. When the child sees him or herself in the mirror, Lacan says, it discovers for the first time that its own body hangs together. All the limbs are connected. There is an instant instance, what he refers to as the eye, that can manipulate the image by moving the limbs. Okay, so this is the eye moving the limbs. Yeah? However, and this is key to understanding Lacan, this is an ultimately traumatic encounter with a phantasmatic image. The child sees the image as a kind of ideal, a state in which all our shortcomings and failures, our experience of fragmentation and inadequacy, this can be overcome in this image. In short, the child image in the mirror comes to serve as its ideal ego. And this is a, a term uh, Lacan takes from Freud. It is a standard against which we come to measure our own sense of shortcoming. And ultimately, the example against which we cannot but fail. Our image in the mirror provides us with what Lacan called an orthopedic totality. It's to, supposed to fit us, this image is supposed to fit us like a shoe on our feet. And when it doesn't, it comes a source of aggressiveness. 
And therefore, in the story of martial arts, the central feature of the martial artist, and notably in our case, Bruce Lee, as an ideal towards which young people can strive and become healed, appears to be blind to this kind of constitutive fragmentation. With Lacan, we ask if we can ever become whole in this sense, and if any role model or ideal ego can do this kind of work for us. So this is kind of a critique of the sociological, the dominant sociological reading of Bruce Lee and martial arts as a place where young people can find a, a home and identity for themselves. Yeah? Now, uh, in the second case, we will go on to look at uh, Bruce Lee's uh, totality, and we, we're going to look at these two quotes here. Yeah? How to find out what Bruce Lee's own philosophy was? There are several possible sources for this, and we will look at some of them in turn. Let's begin with a document that was available on the internet back in 2004, so that's almost 20 years ago now. We should be aware that the internet is a highly shifting matter, and that 15 to 20 years is indeed a very long time in this entity. This particular document on the left on your screen now existed on the website brucelee.com, and though the domain exists anymore, it, this document doesn't exist today. The header on the document said, documentation written by Bruce Lee in original format. So what can we assume about the authenticity here? We went to ask the expert, and who could have better credentials on this than Paul Bauman, who is now with the University of Cardiff. He is a scholar and a self-confessed lover of Bruce Lee, has published tons of books on him. So within the hour, he answers back, and this is a quote from that mail. The traditional packaging and repackaging Bruce Lee quotations under different titles is almost as old as Bruce Lee's tendency to package and repackage quotations from other people under different titles and to attribute authorship to him. In other words, this sounds like it is likely to be a repackaging of his essay, Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate which is one of the few texts that was definitely authored by him without any sense of borrowing heavily from others. We're going to look at the text uh, mentioned by Bauman here, but first let's uncover the likely source of all these texts. Well, now we have three texts in circulation, yeah? What is clear is that prior to his untimely death in 1973, Lee had written many notes that he probably wanted to assemble into a book. Two years later, in 1975, his widow, Linda, published a manuscript edited, edited by herself and some of Bruce Lee's collaborators and students. This book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, was composed from Lee's notes in various stages of completion. Some of these notes have probably slipped out and become parts of other fragmentary texts, such as the article mentioned by Bauman that was published in Black Belt magazine in already 1973, and possibly also the text found on brucelee.com later in 2004. So, what is the reason that we are so interested in asserting the authenticity of these texts? And the answer, from a philosophical perspective, of course, the answer is to be found in that the, the precise framing of certain key themes, or in our case, one particular theme, which we will look at here, uh, since the exact choice of words crucially impact on our decoding of Bruce Lee's philosophy. For instance, the passage from the mysterious 2004 document goes like this, and this is the text on the left side of your screen now. To define Jit Kundo as a style is to miss it completely. If JKD is not a style or a method, maybe it is neutral or maybe it is indifference. However, this is not the case either, for JKD is both at once this and not this and JKD is neither opposed to styles nor not opposed to them. To understand fully, one must transcend the duality of for and against into one organic whole. And this is the key sentence. Within the absolute, there is simply no distinction. Everything is. The crux of the argument here is that Lee's approach transcends questions of style and method. And this is a central theme that we find throughout all the relevant texts. This transcendence entails that Lee is neither opposed to styles, but also not opposed to them. In other words, his approach goes beyond or transcends styles. 
In the penultimate sentence of our quote, he brings home this point by urging practitioners to release themselves from the opposition of for and against and embrace the contradictory nature of the opposition itself. However, what we are most interested in is the final sentence. Within the absolutes, there is simply no distinction, everything is. Could this really be Lee's own formulation? There are some known sources to Bruce Lee's thinking, and in some of them such transcendental thinking, such overcoming of dualities, are fairly common. For instance, in the very title of his posthumously published book, the Tao features as a key to understanding. It does seem fairly certain that Taoism had a profound influence on Lee. I think we can, we know that. Now, what about the text from 1971, the one that, according to Bauman, can certainly be attributed to Lee? In this text, Lee elaborated his fighting style as an approach that neither opposes nor adheres to any style. This is the text on your right. To understand this fully, one must transcend the duality of for and against into one organic unity that is without distinctions. So here in 1971, Lied emphasized his approach, the transcendence of dualism as a way of fighting. Only in 2004, maybe 1973, we don't know when this was written, had this approach become a fully fledged philosophy that pertained also to issues beyond martial arts strictly. It is only later that we learn that within the absolute, there is simply no distinction, everything is. To a philosopher, this is an important matter. While Lee grew up in China, he was born in America and spent much of his adult life there. According to his wife, Linda, Lee was an avid reader, also of philosophical works, and he may well have been familiar with the philosophy of Baruch Spinoza, an Enlightenment philosopher with a completely transformative view on divinity. So transformative, in fact, that he was expelled from his faith community on the grounds that his writing was considered atheistic. It is in Spinoza's ethics that we find the famous formulation of God as a being that is absolutely infinite, that is a substance consisting of an infinity of attributes of which, of which each one expresses an eternal and infinite essence. So this is uh, almost the exact wording that we find in Lee. Yeah? So what is at stake here is whether Lee's totality is only a unity of fighting styles, or if we should regard it as an approach to being, a sense in which there is a substance that is absolutely infinite and indivisible. Are we limited to an approach to fighting, or are we talking about a philosophy of life? When we are within this absolute, part of this totality within which there are no divisions, we are certainly in a universe where, as Spinoza put it, there is nothing contingent, where everything is determined by necessity. This may be attractive for a fighter who seeks to outsource her or his agency, to generate a sense in which the fighter is purely reactive, flowing, as Lee put it, like water. But it nevertheless conjures up the idea that there is a subject who is completely determined and utterly powerless to the forces of nature. Is the event of becoming oneself, the moment of liberation then, in Lee, not only an instance of forgetting, an eclipse of the self, but also of self-effacement, and finally of self-denial? So here we get into finally the art of the self that we find in Bruce Lee. Because surely the only sense in which we are completely at one with nature is in our demise when we are reduced to purely inanimate matter. Further, insofar as our unfolding takes place in a domain that is completely determined, where there is nothing that is excessive, that sticks out or can be subject to chance, there simply is no event. With Alain Badiou, a contemporary French philosopher, we learn that in a natural situation, a situation without excesses or singularities, there are no events. And while this does not mean that nothing happens in nature, what it means is that nothing happens to nature from the outside. It is in this very sense that to Badiou, a living cat must be considered a historical situation, since there is at least one eventual site that defines the cat. It can die. And when it cannot die anymore, when it is dead, 
it is no longer historical, it is purely natural, yeah? Insofar as this existential event, the event of dying, defines living beings, we are also historical beings, which is to say that we are not exhausted by our historical situation, sorry, by our natural situation. There is something that sticks out, the possibility of an event that would overturn the totality, the absolute character of destin determination. And that event is precisely what enables us to change our destiny. This is us. Yeah? What, what is non-natural. It is here that we turn again to the art of the martial artist. For is it not so that it is precisely as an event that the martial artist, Bruce Lee's martial artist, moreover, comes into being? Our claim is that it was this artistic event that broke open the smooth flow of largely racial and colonial perceptions of martial arts. In fact, that brought martial arts into our culture as such. What is key here, however, is that this philosophy, whether as a philosophy of fighting or as a philosophy of life, is not and never has been pure. It isn't purely Eastern, nor purely Western, neither only about fighting, but also not clearly not about fighting. It approaches totalities and as such deals with the philosophical question of the absolute. The liberation of Bruce Lee then was and indeed is an event that doesn't promise to heal the rupture of the self, the fighter or being, but that seeks to overcome divisions in order to, in order to incorporate them and make them part of a totality that is us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor, for your speech. Now I have a question for you. Uh, what is your private personal approach to the figure of Bruce Lee? Is he a philosopher or a fighting spirit? Uh, well, he's both, clearly. But I think uh, in our popular culture, the emphasis has been placed uh, largely on him as a fighter and not sure that that is a fair assessment. I think he was first and foremost a performer and an artist, but he was clearly a, a very competent fighter as well. It's just that, you know, if he had only been a fighter, we wouldn't know about Bruce Lee, at least not to the extent today. It was a film such as Enter the Dragon that created martial arts uh, in the English language and in our culture. So I think it is Bruce Lee as an artist that we have to thank for this uh, innovation. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, now we'll move to the next speaker. Um, we'll start with um, Master of Arts Magda Magdalena Grelachen from Jagiellonia University in Krakow, uh, presenting a speech. Han mm for -hmm. Yundong, The Return of the Warriors. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you and see you. Okay, and now I will try to share my screen, so I will ask for your cooperation if uh, you are able to uh, see it. No problem. Uh, I can see it. Okay, uh, if it will be some problem with uh, changing the slide, please uh, tell me about it, because sometimes uh, there is this kind of uh, the problem. Okay. Okay, so now we, I will start. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Magdalena Grelachen. I am a PhD student in the Institute of the Middle and Far East, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Uh, in my interest area, there are issues related to the traditional dress in Asia, especially in China and India. Uh, Han Fu is important to me also on a practical level uh, since I used to wear it by myself, uh, as you can see uh, also today. Uh, thus, uh, I am very glad that today I can present the topic related to the Han Fu movement and 
recreation uh, of the warrior's image. Uh, the aim of my presentation is to discuss the reappearance of warrior's image connected uh, with the revitalization of forgotten Hanfu, uh, which takes place not only in China, but also in Chinese diaspora around the world. Uh, these issues are consequences uh, of the Hanfu Yundong. Uh, therefore, before uh, I will talk about warrior's image, it said, uh, I would like to explain what the Hanfu is. Hanfu, uh, literally uh, a clothing of the Han people, includes a group of garments developed from the ancient Shenyi dress, uh, which was in use during Warring States period. This dress uh, later changed into Han dynasty robes. Uh, but uh, fashion is never static, so Hanfu form was changing through dynasties. Uh, each period uh, has its own fashion correlated with uh, particular aesthetics. Uh, now let's take a look uh, how Hanfu has become a, a symbol of a powerful social movement. Uh, it is said that Hanfu movement, uh, as we can translate Hanfu Indo, uh, was born in 2003 uh, after actions undertaken by Wang Letian in Zhengzhou, uh, Henan province. Uh, one day, uh, while he was wearing Hanfu on the street during an ordinary day, the photos of him uh, had been taken and later uploaded on the internet. Uh, you can see it uh, on the left, uh, these uh, one Letian's photos. Uh, uh, these photographs uh, has become extremely popular, and later he found many admirers who did the same. Now we can observe that uh, more and more people is uh, interested in this activity. The goal of Hanfu movement uh, is not only to reconstruct uh, prepare the shows or role plays, but also to use Hanfu in daily life. Uh, its popularity is especially visible among young people. Uh, they have opportunity to join uh, Hanfu dedicated clubs during studies at university. Uh, they meet together, dressed in Hanfu, discuss clothing types, uh, and ways uh, how to make them. Uh, later, some of them choose Hanfu business uh, as their career path, uh, recreating the spirit and image of the ancient warriors uh, has become uh, one of the faces uh, of uh, Hanfu movement. And uh, now I would like to explain uh, how to become 21st century warrior. Uh, my goal is to uh, present a few most prominent aesthetics. Uh, but first, uh, please watch this short film and feel the power of Hanfu uh, by yourself. Uh, Hanfu movement members look exactly like this. And this is their daily fashion. Uh, and now I hope that this it will be working. <laughs> Hanfu brands 
to describe these kinds of their products. Uh, so it's not exactly a reconstruction. Uh, the historic uh, Wei and Jin dynasty style was a bit similar, uh, but in some parts uh, of the reconstruction uh, were some differences. Uh, the biggest one was characteristic flo floating ribbons and so-called swirl ties, which decorated the skirt. Uh, nowadays, Wei Jin uh, Hanfu only sometimes contains uh, these uh, parts, but in most parts, uh, in most cases, not. Uh, this kind of hanfu is often prepared as a couple set. So often they are also called uh, neutral hanfu, since they are suitable both for men and women. Uh, this kind of hanfu is also widely used while portraying the world of the jianghu. Uh, people uh, tend to use them to prepare photo session showing a lonely warrior with close relations to the nature. Uh, this kind of hanfu is also very good uh, if there is a couple and they want to do some activities together and wear some matching um, clothing. Uh, the next one uh, is portrayal which use a uh, Dao Pao robe. Uh, this kind of dress is sometimes named as Taoist robe and it was used by scholars. Uh, Dao Pao is a long robe with white sleeves. It can be fastened with a sash. On the top could be added another sleeveless garment and it can be seen on this uh, photograph. Uh, Dao Pao could be also used to recreate uh, fearless royalty figures. Uh, as we can see in these pictures, uh, the contrast uh, is very visible. Uh, on the left, there is painting of the scholar. Uh, on the right, there is half a woman member dressed in modern Dao Pao containing rich colors and embroideries. Uh, the next one is Dao Ling Pao. Uh, this name is connected with the collar type, uh, a round one. This is a group of garments uh, with a different length and sleeve types. In the picture there uh, is a shorter version. Uh, however, there could be also uh, longer ones. Uh, these robes with narrow sleeves are, are taken from Tang Dynasty fashion. And today I am also wearing Daolin Pao. Uh, here is a round collar, but uh, I have very white sleeves. Uh, and uh, my Daolin Pao is more Song Dynasty style or Ming Dynasty style, so a little, a little bit uh, later. Uh, Another uh, very popular kind of dress is Ming Dynasty Yesa. Uh, it brings strong military vibe. This garment is quite easy to wear uh, and perform. Uh, it became one of the most iconic uh, Ming, Ming Dynasty garment, although it was invented during Mongol rule and later altered a bit by the new dynasty. Uh, this dress, the name of this dress is also read as Isa, uh, if pronunciation is taken from Mongolian. Uh, sometimes uh, people tend to read this also as Isa, uh, so it could be a bit uh, confusing. Uh, one of the most uh, popular among uh, Yesa's kinds uh, is Fei Fu. Uh, Fei Yu is the name of the used pattern and it could be translated uh, as a flying fish, uh, but there is no fish there, uh, as we can see on this uh, photograph. Uh, Fei Yu means one kind of a dragon. Uh, Chinese dragons were divided on a few kinds. Uh, for example, Emperor's dragon was different uh, than a dragon used on robes of less important figures. Uh, Fei Yu Fu uh, was a dress used by Jin Yi Wei, uh, a little emperor's bodyguard. Uh, this kind of dress depicts honor and virtues of a great warrior. Uh, that is why 
why nowadays it is a popular uh, choice. Uh, the proper dress is not only a needed item while trying to depict uh, a warrior. Uh, weapon is needed as well as other accessories. Uh, sword uh, and folding fan are the most often uh, used one. Uh, Chinese sword is a very graceful uh, weapon and it will be, uh, it could be a very universal tool. Uh, it could be used in many different ways and depict uh, different characters. And uh, they could be a different kind of the swords. So on the photograph, uh, is a, um, here is a little bit more classic one, but my, sword, my own sword is a little bit more special with some uh, buff here uh, to bring luck for me. Uh, the same uh, goes with the fan. It is a very universal uh, tool. Uh, cyber uh, seems to be less popular uh, due, due to strong impression uh, it creates. Uh, straw hot, uh, often combined with a piece of fabric to cover the face, is a perfect while recreating a member of the jungle. Uh, as we can see on this uh, photograph. Uh, there is no need to know uh, martial arts, uh, since these uh, weapons are not used to fight with anyone. Uh, of course, uh, knowledge how to use a sword uh, could be help to take more realistic photographs. Uh, uh, harmful movement uh, gave uh, women uh, a chance to redefine their image. Uh, it is possible for them to wear men clothing and depict a, a strong and powerful person. Uh, it seems that the most interesting case uh, is to impersonate Jinny Wei, as we can see on these photographs, uh, a woman. Uh, while trying to dress herself in Feiyu Fu, uh, is able to show her brave features and fearless spirit. Uh, she does not need to be only an outlaw warrior, as we could see in the previous, uh, previous photographs. Uh, to conclude, uh, while recreating the warrior image by harmful movement members, uh, the most important thing is to understand a hidden message behind uh, this clause. Uh, it is something more than just uh, a seasonal fashion. Uh, each robe, uh, depending on used colors, uh, embroideries, accessories, etc., uh, has its own energy and meaning. Uh, while choosing a certain uh, handful, uh, you should uh, know uh, about this and choose wisely. Uh, the feeling of clothing energy and understanding one's own emotions is a very important factor. Uh, handful which variety of designs uh, brings a possibility to choose the right one for everyone. Uh, it is a new way to express uh, oneself. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. If there are any questions to me, I will try to answer them. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any questions for you. Maybe later there will be some questions in the comment section uh, underneath our stream so you can answer them. Okay. Mm. Thank you once again for your speech, uh, Mrs. Magdalena. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is the end of our Congress. Thank you very much for your participation and attention. This is all for me. Uh, Sandra, now is your turn. Okay, so please tell me if you can hear me. We can hear you. 
Okay, perfect. So this was the last speech of the third Wrocław Chinese Martial Arts Congress. We are glad that so many people interested in martial arts watched us during the past three days. Uh, we saw all of this on our streams, so we know that there were so many, so many people interested. And we encourage you to follow our social media and to watch the presentation, which uh, will be uploaded both on our Facebook and YouTube profiles. Soon we will provide all the links uh, on our fa Facebook page. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much and uh, see you next year. Uh, thanks to the University of Wroclaw Synology Students Club, Confucius Institute at the University of Wroclaw, and this edition patrons, Szczecin Asian Club and Mandarin Speaking Club Wroclaw, Shodan Martial, uh, Martial Arts Club from Legnica. And personally, I'd like to thank Dr. Stefania skowron markowska Magda, Victoria, Aleksander, Laura, Marta, Alicja, Natalia, Karolina, Klaudia, Agnieszka, Valeria, Zosia, Ada, Kuba, Szymon, Arek and Jacek. Now I'm giving voice to Dr. Stefania skowron markowska our secretary of the Congress. Okay, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we do. Oh, that's great. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for participation in this uh, very important event for us because, it, as you know, it's not easy time for organizing some kind of things, especially when you want to gather people together, uh, people who are fascinated with the same uh, topics. Uh, so thanks to technology, we could be able to do that. Not only the technology, but I would like to thank you especially to Mrs. Sandra and her team because they did so great job. Uh, actually, without those people, those this Congress couldn't, you know, simply run because there was so much work to do in every time when we organize the things like this, that without the helping of those people, it just could be impossible. So thank you very much, Ms. Sandra and the Versa <coughs> Synology Club. And I would like to also thank you all the participants and all the people who were watching us, who were sending comments, uh, also uh, greetings for us and the, the, the appreciation that we did a lot of good job. Yes, we, we feel very happy to hear that and to see the, uh, your uh, comments. And just like Mrs. Sandra said, uh, we hope to see you next time in the next edition. Just uh, take care and uh, watch our social media. And soon we will uh, probably uh, <clears throat> publish some extra information about the new year's edition next year's uh, edition because we want to you know to to continue our uh, our passion and uh, you know to gather so many uh, as many people who are fascinating with the martial arts uh, as it's possible so thank you very much and see you next time in the next edition of congress thank you <laughs>